Comrades, no other event in human history has been lied about quite as much as the Russian Revolution. Now, the British comrades will see, uh, have seen a taste of this around Jeremy Corbyn. The, the vicious slanders of the press. And the Venezuelan comrades would have seen the, uh, the slanders against Hugo Chavez and the Venezuelan Revolution. But nothing is so deserving of the hatred of the ruling class as the Russian Revolution of 1917. Because only here did the working class so efficiently overthrow the old order. Only here did uh, the workers, the peasants, overthrow the men in suits, the, uh, the lords and ladies that control their lives. And therefore, a hundred years after the Russian Revolution, all of these lies have been rehashed. <laughs> Trotsky commented how the lies poured down like a Niagara. Niagara. Niagara, Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. Niagara, see. Si. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's called Niagara. <laughs> I live there. It's called Niagara. <laughs> Although, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so though the lies started from the very first day, after the, the first news of the October Revolution uh, was uh, spread throughout the, the Western press, and, and these stories talked how the, the Petrograd Bolsheviki had an electronically operated guillotine. And this guillotine could uh, lop off 500 heads in an hour. I, I could see some of the comrades are curious about where they could get such a machine. <laughs> Also, uh, bourgeois ladies were supposed to uh, register with the Bureau of Free Love. <laughs> Where they would be parceled out to proletarian husbands on a rotational basis. <laughs> Such things were in the Western media in 1917. Other horrors were described too. Such as wealthy women being forced to do cleaning and housework. <laughs> or high rank businessmen being forced to stand on street corners and sell newspapers to survive. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the comrades know how horrific it is to stand around and sell newspapers. <laughs> but uh, uh, th this lead off is based on an article that should uh, go into publication soon. Uh, the, which is going to be titled The Top Ten Lies About the Bolshevik Revolution. There are literally millions of lies. 
And Lenin was fond of saying that one fool can ask ten times more questions than ten wise men can answer. We're going to try and boil it down to the top ten. Uh, we're aided by a phenomenon that Trotsky spoke about that all political slander is essentially poor and monotonous. But the aim is to arm the comrades with the tools to answer these lies in the movement. So hopefully everybody will find this useful. Even if it's a little bit distasteful. Okay, number one, the first lie. Lenin was a German agent. Now, th th this is a very important lie because it's the lie of the July days in 1917. This lie led to the Bolsheviks being illegalized. Lenin was forced into hiding. Trotsky was imprisoned. The Bolshevik printing presses were smashed. And rank and file comrades were beaten up, even murdered. But uh, after a few weeks, the uh, Russian workers saw through this lie. And Bolshevik support in the country rose from mid August onwards. However, the fact that this was debunked after three weeks in, in Russia doesn't mean it can't be repeated internationally. In fact, a month ago, the New York Times repeat, wrote an article repeating these lies word for word. The New York Times is obviously very committed to environmentalism as they're very good at recycling. <laughs> so, how, how, so, how does this lie go? So, Lenin went on a sealed train through Germany. While he was there, he accepted orders and gold from the Kaiser. And actively worked to sabotage the Allied war effort against Germany. So, what is the truth? Yes, Lenin went through Germany. And the sealed train was his insistence. Precisely because he knew that this slander would arise because of travelling through Germany. Lenin said nobody should come on, nobody should go off. But what was his alternative? The, the Allies had blocked the road to revolutionary Russia for, for Lenin. For a very clear reason, they didn't want Lenin in Russia. Look what happened to Trotsky. He caught steamship from New York. And he was arrested for a month in Halifax, Canada. By, by a British Secret Service. So it wasn't really an option of Lenin just to stay in isolation in Switzerland. As nice as Switzerland must be. 
Also, what's forgotten in this lie is that Martov and many of the other Mensheviks chose the same route to get into Russia. But they're not accused of, it, of being German agents. All right. So what of the German gold? Well, uh, if Pravda was receiving outside money, it definitely didn't look like it. It was the, uh, the, the smallest and the worst distributed paper of all of the left papers. And the reformist papers did have rich backers. The New York Times article reveals that workers in demonstrations were paid 10 rubles to attend. But in 1921, the liberal leader Milyukov said it was 15 rubles. So the New York Times is not only, they're not only environmentalists, they're also a good place to get a bargain. But, but this money has never been found. There's no paper trail. Surely there's got to be some form of distribution network to get it throughout the Tsarist Empire. You know, maybe the train driver saw this money. No, nothing has ever been found. It is blatantly ridiculous. And in fact, this allegation occurs pretty much with every mass movement. It reminds you, there's an opera by Wagner called uh, uh, Das Rheingold. This, this uh, tells the story of a magical gold that makes the bearer all powerful. So it's clearly the Kaiser gave Lenin the Rhine gold that made him powerful enough to convince millions of Russian workers. This even came about in the, uh, the protest against Trump. Apparently, uh, Jewish liberal billionaire George Soros gave, I had a fund for, to give $3,500 to every protester against Trump. <laughs> I suggest that every comrade write to Soros and get their money, be very good for the fighting fund. <laughs> But the reality is that the power, the magical power of Lenin is that he put forward the ideas that the Russian people were looking for. And in fact, not only was Lenin not a German agent, he was partially responsible for bringing down the Kaiser. A month, uh, a year after the Russian Revolution, a mutiny broke out in the German fleet. Kaiser Wilhelm was forced to resign on November 9th. 
Inspired by the Russian Revolution. And this precipitated the end of the First World War. On the other side, it was actually the Russian bourgeois who were colluding with the Germans. Kerensky was preparing to abandon Petrograd uh, and give it over to the Germans to massacre the Soviet. In the final analysis, for the bourgeois, class always trumps nation. They would rather have German imperialism controlled uh, Petrograd than the Russian workers. So that's the first slide dealt with. So the second line you may have heard. The, the October Revolution was a violent coup d'etat. So we hear that you know, February was a, a peaceful democratic revolution. But the evil megalomaniacs Lenin and Trotsky overthrew democracy. And installed a totalitarian dictatorship in October. None of this is true. Well, for the liberals, the term peaceful tends to be used very liberally. <laughs> peaceful is another word of things they like. And violence is a word for things they don't like. Uh, during the peaceful February Revolution, which they support, <laughs> approximately 1,500 people died. And, and this was mostly the uh, Tsar's troops filing directly on unarmed protesters. But the workers and soldiers armed themselves, and there was definitely casualties on the other side. And you can guarantee that in the, the final days, the worst torturers of the Zara Seekers police were strung up. But you could be sure this was all done peacefully. So if February was peaceful and October was violent, then, then how many people died in October? Almost nobody died in October. Yeah, Alan told the story a few days ago how more people died in the filming of Eisenstein's October than in the actual seizure of the Winter Palace. And this event brought Russia out of the war, saving the lives of potentially thousands and millions. The irony is, is that those who are opposed to the so-called violence of revolution are the ones who are supportive of the violence of war. Okay, let's deal with the violence question. How about October being a coup? 
Well, there's two definitions of coup in the political dictionary. What is seizure of power by a minority? And the other is an illegal, unconstitutional transfer of power. Were the Bolsheviks in a minority? No primary source after September 1917 supports this. They had overwhelming support in every urban centre. And in, and in the countryside, the left social revolutionaries had majority support. And this party supported Soviet power and uh, supported a coalition government with the Bolsheviks. Okay, but, but perhaps they did, they did, the Bolsheviks did have majority support for Soviet power, but it, it was unconstitutional, it was illegal. As Trump would say, wrong. <laughs> what was the constitutional basis of the February regime? Well, the, the ma while the masses were fighting on the streets, the liberals were sort of looking from their rich apartments in horror. They had nothing to do with overthrowing the Tsar, and they tried desperately to save the Tsar. The mass movement on the streets created democratic Soviets. With one delegate per thousand workers. The soldiers also elected delegates. The delegates were open to immediate recall. And, but in the dying days of the February Revolution, the, the liberals organised in the Duma declared themselves the provisional government. <laughs> With no democratic mandate whatsoever. Now, it was based upon the Duma. Now, the Duma was never elected in 1917. The elections were completely biased. That the, uh, it was a purely a consultative body under the Tsar. And it was weighted towards the landowners and capitalists. So that the vault of one landowner would be equivalent to sort of tens or hundreds of thousands of workers and peasants. But the Soviets uh, elected reformist leaders, Mensheviks and SRs. who in turn supported the provisional government. The only democratic mandate of the provisional government derived from the Soviets. It was a Lent mandate of the reformists. And the Soviets were the only democratic representative bodies in the whole of Russia. On the uh, 7th of November, the All-Russia Congress of Soviets met. 
2017 il congresso del secondo congresso per la Russia dei Soviet si riunì to discuss all powers of the Soviets and removing the, the mandate from the provisional government. There were 649 delegates from all of Russia. The Bolsheviks had 390 delegates. The left SRs had 100. Creating a decisive majority for Soviet power. So, even within the legal constitutional setup of February, the October Revolution was perfectly legal. The October Revolution passes every test and was not a coup. Done. <laughs> okay, number three. Without Lenin, Russia would have become a liberal democracy. So let, Russia would have turned into a nice, peaceful, democratic country. Like France or Britain or Canada. This myth bears no relation to reality. The first provisional government put the Liberals in power. If, if Russia was going to be a nice, peaceful, liberal democracy, then that would have been a perfectly stable government. They would have given the people what they wanted. Just land to the peasants. An end to the war. Freedom for the oppressed nationalities and food to the cities. But the Liberals can achieve none of these things. And all of this was summed up in the Bolshevik slogan of peace, land and bread. So, due to the Liberals' inability to solve this crisis, they formed a coalition government with the reformists. But the reform, but the coalition government couldn't provide peace, land, and bread. So it was replaced with an almost entirely reformist government with Kerensky at its head. They could, this reformist government could not even convene the Constituent Assembly. Because they feared that it would give too much support to the Bolsheviks. And stepwise, the Bolshevik slogan of all power to the Soviets was gaining support in the country. And the ruling class realized that they could no longer trust any of their parties in all of these any of these democratic maneuvers. And that's when they decided to move away from any democratic pretense. And they moved behind General Kornilov's fascist coup. This wouldn't have been a nice, peaceful coup. <laughs> Kornilov would have drowned every Soviet city in blood. 
And he wouldn't have stopped there. He would have probably strung Kerensky up too. At this point, the only solution in Russia was socialism or fascism. The workers wanted socialism, the uh, landowners, the capitalists, the monarchists wanted fascism of some sort. But we hear the Bolsheviks lost the vote in the Constituent Assembly elections. First of all, let's, forget, let's not forget who called the Constituent Assembly elections. The Liberals, the Reformists, none of them did. No, it was organized by the Bolshevik-led Soviets. And what were the results? 41% for the SRs. 24% Bolshevik. Under 5% Cadet. And 3% Menshevik. So let's compare the Bolsheviks with the cadets. So the party of uh, Soviet power versus the party of Kornilov's reaction. Twenty-four versus five percent. The Bolsheviks gained decisive majorities in all the urban centres. They also got two-thirds of the vote on the Western Front, the soldiers. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the Socialist Revolutionary Vote was confused. That the, the SR party had split between left and right. The left supported Soviet power, the right did not. And the peasantry uh, voted, because, uh, but the, uh, the lists did not recognize this difference. And the countryside voted overwhelmingly for the SRs. But when the Constituent Assembly met, it was a sort of bizarre hybrid anomaly. The movement had proceeded beyond it. The workers wanted Soviet power, which was a hundred times more democratic than constituent democracy. <laughs> where you elect people based upon uh, your workplace. Delegates are open to immediate recall. Receive a wage of a skilled worker. As opposed to sort of constituent democracy where your representative just goes off for years and you never see them again. And the, and the whites, the reaction, wanted nothing to do with the Constituent Assembly. They were looking to methods of civil war and fascism. It was actually an anarchist who had brought an end to the Constituent Assembly. The, the, the head of the guard uh, was, a, was an anarchist. Uh, 
And at 4 a.m. he just said, the guard is tired, I propose to close the meeting and let everybody go home. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> nobody cried, nobody fought, nobody cared. The movement went on. Okay. Next. The Bolsheviks committed atrocities in the Civil War. Here's a surprising fact. War is violent. In fact, in the early days of the revolution, the revolutionaries were way too lenient. They would capture Tsarist officers and would set them free on the basis of a promise never to fight against the workers. Many of these bastards went off to kill thousands. And the revolutionary workers learned very quickly not to be so soft. They should have all been locked up. What was the reality in the Civil War? Yes, a lot of people were killed on all sides. But if you look at the reality of the Civil War, the Whites went on to, pr to produce the most horrific atrocities. Uh, from one example, they filled three freight cars with bodies. They put the frozen corpses in obscene positions. And they sent these freight cars to starving Petrograd under the slogan of fresh meat. Anybody su suspected of being a communist was mutilated. Their eyes gouged out, their tongues removed, buried alive. Denikin's army was an orgy of looting, raping, and pogroms. When, when they seized territory, the peasant land was returned to the Lord. And vengeance was enacted on the uh, workers and peasants. In this context, many who supported the Mensheviks and the reformists in the previous period all joined the Reds. There's, there's one example of a prison escape in uh, Kolchak's capital. And he murdered 2,000 in revenge. Now you'd think that uh, sabotaging rail lines would be a fairly standard um, tactic in a civil war. Well, every time the Reds sabotaged the rail lines, uh, the Whites hanged three pr prisoners by that break. Uh, 
con lo scambio e i bianchi applicavano tre persone. And yes, there were red reprisals. How could there not be? How could you hold the people back in the face of such atrocities? <laughs> But this was far less than the whites. But, but don't take my word for it. The American General Graves uh, wrote his uh, memoirs. Where he said, for every one atrocity committed by the Reds, a hundred atrocities were committed by the Whites. These reactionaries, they don't oppose violence. What they oppose is the poor standing up against the rich. And we don't want violence. But we are not pacifists. We believe that the majority has every right to defend themselves against the minority, the violent minority. And defend themselves by proportionate means. And they will never forget the Russian working class from winning the civil war. And that's what matters to these people. Okay, done. Continuing on the theme of violence, the Romanovs were killed in cold blood. Hands up, everybody who's heard of the killing of the Romanovs. Everybody has their hand up. Hands up if you have heard of the killing of the 26 Baku commissars at the same time. I see two comrades putting their hands up. Three. Four. Okay, very good. So, why do you know about the Romanovs but not the 26 Baku commissars? These are two events who happened uh, within a month of each other. It's almost like some lives are more important than others. This murder was, the 26 Baku commissars, was, that atrocity was committed by British imperialism. But we're not supposed to remember those people. The other thing we're not supposed to know is the 5,000 protesters Nicholas was, was killed in the, February, sorry, in the 1905 revolution. We, you know, we tell, we're told the story of Nicholas being a quiet, humble man. Well in, well, in Russia, he was known as Nicholas the Bloody. He was a member of the anti-Semitic Union of Russian People. He funded it and wore its badge proudly. Okay. 
The union was responsible for organizing murderous programs against the Jewish population. Murder, rape, pillage. Against men, women, children, infants even. Torture, burning, dismemberment. In one incident in Odessa, 800 Jews were murdered. 5,000 wounded. 100,000 made homeless. Nicholas wasn't ignorant over these uh, events. He called them the actions of loyal people. He said that terror must be met with terror. <laughs> and yes, his final act of violence was to order his troops to fire directly into the unarmed protesters in the February Revolution. So, no, Nicholas definitely deserved his fate. And, and if you look at the, the actions of the imperialists, they're, they're no different, they're no better. Uh, Hillary Clinton was even recorded laughing over the death of Gaddafi. Now we don't cry over Gaddafi or people like this, but don't give us any nonsense about the sanctity of human life. The imperialists don't cry over the thousands of children killed in Iraq by Bush and Blair's bombs. Or Obama's drones in Pakistan. But these victims are nameless and meant to be forgotten by the rich and powerful. Okay, so some admit that Nicholas was a tyrant, but what about his family? I'm afraid that Nicholas didn't hesitate to murder entire families of Jews and revolutionaries. Or let's give a modern example. How is this different from a guided missile strike? That kills two insurgents but 30 family members. Now, of course, this wasn't ideal. Trotsky wanted to do a public trial to detail all of the crimes of the Romanov dynasty. But in the conditions of the civil war, this wasn't possible. The, the white armies were threatening to uh, take uh, the, the very nice accommodations that uh, Nicholas was being imprisoned in. And if they could have got hold of even a single member of the uh, royal family, it would have been a rallying point for the white armies.
They tell us that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was necessary because it saved lives and shortened the war. Now that's a lie. But the ending of the Romanov dynasty shortened the war and saved lives. It demoralized the whites and aided the war effort. The whites would not have hesitated in murdering entire communist families, families of Reds. You see that the, uh, the tens of thousands that they killed in the, uh, uh, the Paris Commune. The bourgeois killed. Or after Spartacus's revolt, how they lined the Appian Way with slaves. The workers knew they had to fight to the end, and they did so, and they won, and it was good. Okay, next. This one's for the anarchists. Trotsky murdered the Kronstadt sailors. And how often we heard from sort of our anarchist friends, you know, Kronstadt, Kronstadt, Kronstadt. Sadly, those yelling this out have often not done their homework to find out what actually happened in the revolt. The reality is that the Kronstadt revolt was an unfortunate tragedy of the Civil War. It's not the result of the dictatorial actions of the Bolsheviks. Now, the name of Kronstadt rightfully deserves pride of place in the annals of the revolution. In 1917, the Kronstadters were the most courageous fighters. But the Kronstadters of 1921 were not the same people as 1917. The Kronstadters of 17, they were the first to volunteer, fight and die in the Civil War. The 1921 Kronstadters were largely the sons of peasants. In the Civil War, uh, the Soviets adopted the policy of war communism. Basically put, war communism was a grain requisition from the peasants to feed the soldiers and the workers in the cities. And in the first period of the Civil War, the peasants were happy to do this. They were happy to make some sacrifices because the Red Army was stopping the whites from taking back the land. But after a few years, economic interests overcome political sympathies. And the peasants started to demand free trade in grain.
And the Kronstadt children of peasants, sons of peasants, took up this demand also. And yes, uh, there were a few anarchists on the island. And an anarchist inspired manifesto was written. But the key demand was free trade in grain and end to war communism. Now the workers' start, state began negotiating with the Kronstadters. But this was towards the end of winter. And time was running out. Kronstadt is a fortress that controls the shipping in and out of Petrograd. In winter, there's an ice bridge to the fortress. But once this melts, there is literally no way of taking the island. In a, in the, if the workers' state had lost control of Kronstadt, it could, they could literally starve Petrograd, the proletarian capital. In conditions of civil war, this could never be allowed. And negotiations ran out of time. And so the revolutionaries were forced to retake the island. Now it's utter cynicism that this has been blamed on Trotsky. Trotsky had nothing to do with Kronstadt. Although, as uh, head of the Red Army, of course, he politically agreed with them. But there's a political necessity to tar the good name of Trotsky in the left opposition. Whatever the best wishes of the Kronstadt sailors were, their actions would have led to the giving up of the island to the whites. <laughs> to, to the white army stationed in Finland. The irony is is that soon after the Kronstadt revolt, uh, the Bolsheviks instituted or ended the, the uh, war communism. They, they uh, began the new economic policy that provided free trade in grain. Now, the, uh, the Bolsheviks had resisted this precisely because they knew it would lead to the strengthening of the rich peasants, the kulaks. But Kronstadt was one of the last symptoms that realised that war communism couldn't go on any further. But... Uh, but this never, the fact that the Kronstadt has supported free trade in grain didn't stop the anarchists from opposing the new economic policy. <laughs> but then the anarchists have never really been known for their consistency, have they, comrades? <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, next. Bolshevism inevitably leads to Stalinist dictatorship. I, I, this is almost certainly one of the main questions that we face every day. But there is no greater slander against the fighters of 1917 than this line. To, in, to identify the revolutionaries with those who betrayed and murdered them. There is a river of blood separating Bolshevism and Stalinism. By 1942, practically the entire Bolshevik Central Committee of 1917 was dead. Dead at the hands of Stalin in the main. If Stalinism was a logical progression of Bolshevism, why would this have been necessary? Surely they could have just been a peaceful reform into dictatorship if it was consistent with Bolshevism. No, there is nothing in common with Bolshevism and Stalin. Stalinism. In fact, the Bolsheviks stood for not just political, but economic democracy. <laughs> Workers' democratic control of production combined with Soviet democracy. <laughs> this is far more democracy than exists under capitalism. <laughs> which on the political level is distorted by big money and gerrymandering. Well, on the economic front, there is absolutely no democracy whatsoever. It's an absolutist dictatorship in the workplace. Unfortunately, Tsarist Russia had a very low level of education. Ninety percent of the population were peasants, and literacy rates were under thirty percent. Under this situation, the young workers' state had to rely on the old Tsarist bureaucrats to get things running. Now, this was okay in the early period where the, the workers could direct the bureaucrats. But after four years of world war, three years of civil war, fighting, 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 the workers were just tired. Or dead. And in this period, after 1921, the Tsarist bureaucrats became, started to become independent of the workers. The workers of 1917 weren't there to control them. And Stalin, who was a secondary figure in 1917, started to represent this clique. He rose to prominence on the backs of bureaucratic functionaries. And Lenin became, uh, started a fight against this tendency, his final fight.
He said that the state machine was like a car not going in the direction of the driver. The state of apparatus, apparatus is still quite alien to us. It's a bourgeois and czarist hodgepodge. Is it, uh, sorry for the translators. There is no doubt that the Soviet workers would drown in this bureaucracy like, riff, uh, uh, like a fly in milk. In 1922, he united with Trotsky to fight Stalin and bureaucracy. Lenin said, Stalin is too rude, and this defect becomes intolerable in a general secretary. I suggest that comrades remove Stalin and appoint another man. Another man who is more tolerant, more loyal, more polite, and more considerate. This is more than enough to prove that Lenin was opposed to bureaucracy and Stalin in particular. But the Bolsheviks banned opposition parties, we hear. <laughs> well, this is true. But why is it true? The fact is that every opposition party uh, took up arms against the workers' state. The Bolsheviks believed in multi-party democracy, as, as do we. Okay, but just imagine if uh, Al-Qaeda tried to run for a parliamentary seat in, Lo in London. Or for governor of New York. I don't think they'd be allowed to run and stand up on, in election debates. Yeah. Anybody picking up a bomb or a gun against the democratic will of the people will quickly lose their democratic rights. <laughs> As in any democratic society. And Trotsky's left opposition, the first fighters against Stalinism, were the lead uh, proponents of democratic rights for the people. It was the genuine Bolsheviks that were fighting Stalinism for the very first day. Were the first to be sent to Siberia, Trotsky was assassinated by a Stalinist agent. So, and, but, the, but these martyrs, these fighters against Stalinism, are forgotten in the line. The lie that Bolshevism leads to Stalinism is an abstract concept outside of time and space. It tells us nothing about the specific conditions in 1920s Russia. It ignores the backwardness, the civil war, the blockade, the invasion of 21 foreign armies.
The failure of the revolution to spread to advanced capitalist countries. The isolation of the revolution. Like it's, it's like the reformists and the anarchists think that bureaucracy is some, you know, uh, just moral failure. Rather than the uh, the product bureaucracy being a product of social relations. Bureaucracy is inevitable consequence of backwardness and shortages. There are two methods of managing shortage. Now the capitalists have a very simple way of managing shortage. If there's not enough of a commodity, you raise the price. If people starve, well, it's their fault for being poor. Now, this solution is not compatible with socialism. So if there's a shortage in a worker's state, the only solution is rationing a line and the only way for a line to be orderly is if you put a cop at the front of it. Otherwise, the strong will just grab whatever they want and the weak will uh, starve. But if there's going to be a line, if there's going to be uh, a cop on that line, he's got to get what's at the front, otherwise he's not going to keep things in order. That is the economic base of bureaucracy. And and there was plenty of shortages and backwardness in the early Soviet Union. Which were the, which were the faults of Tsarism, the war and the civil war. Would we have the same problems now? Well, an advanced capitalist country like Western Europe, North America, doesn't have to face these questions of backwardness. We don't have to face the low cultural level and illiteracy. Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, these countries are producing millions and millions of graduates who can't find jobs. In, in North America, for every four PhDs, there's only one job. And there's not shortages, the capitalists are sitting on billions and billions of dollars of dead money. Uninvested money that is, literally, that is totally unproductive because the capitalists can't make a profit out of it. And state functionaries today aren't privileged like they were in 1917. In fact, in most countries, 
uh, those who work for the state, uh, except for the top echelons, actually unionised. Public sector workers, they're, you know, they're part of the working class, they go on strike quite frequently. A future socialist state could put these workers to use running society. They're not going to be an elite that can be used against the majority of the population. Lenin put forward four conditions for a socialist democracy. The election of all officials with right of recall. No official to receive a wage higher than a skilled worker. The rotation of all bureaucratic tasks. And no outside armed force that could be used against the people. Now, backwardness stopped these points be, from being enacted in the Soviet Union. You know, Lenin said, when everybody's a bureaucrat, nobody is a bureaucrat. We would not face the same problems as 1917. Stalinism is not inevitable. And Bolshevism has nothing to do with Stalinism. Okay, next. You'll love this one. Number eight. Communism killed a hundred million people. <laughs> you see this in newspaper editorials? It's especially popular on internet message boards. It, it, it's like this all-purpose slander. Oh, you're a socialist. Communism killed 100 million. Oh, you want a higher minimum wage? 100 million dead. Are you on healthcare? 100 million, 100 million, 100 million. It's a, it's a fantastic all purpose slander for whenever you've run out of genuine arguments. Well, well this slander is based on the, uh, the so called Black Book of Communism, authored by Stéphane Courtois in 1998. Now, this book has been widely debunked and seen as totally biased. Even some of the co-workers with Courtois denounced the book as, as com using completely uh, hypocritical methodology. And, uh, and they said, yeah, yeah, collaborators said that the 100 million figure cannot be sustained. But that the author was obsessed about reaching this 100 million figure. <laughs> and we know why, it's because it's, it's a very easy figure to remember. Too far? So. And it's very easy, because, uh, it's easy to see why, because the 100 million figure is easy to remember. You know, the, you know uh, some right winger just says 100 million to you. 
And your response has to go into the socio-economic conditions of Stalinism, and you know you have so, to tell a person to sit still for 15 minutes. <laughs> Well, the reality is that over 90% of the deaths in the Black Book refer to Stalinism and Maoism. And we've already explained how Stalinism has nothing to do with genuine Marxism. Uh, yeah, and we do not take responsibility for any of these victims of the Stalinist regimes. But we point out that the first victims of the Stalinist regimes were us. Our comrades. How dare they use the mar our martyrs to attack us. Utterly disgusting. Well, who, who was responsible for the deaths in the Civil War? Who was responsible for the deaths during the Russian Civil War? The Russian workers and peasants decided they wanted Soviet power. Democratically, by overwhelming majority. Actually, one of the uh, proof that it was overwhelming majority is that the, they would never have been able to win the civil war if they didn't have majority support. <laughs> totally isolated, no army. The, the Red Army was able to fight back and win, could, could not have done that if it was unpopular. Whereas the Whites had support of 21 foreign armies. It's like if bandits attack your house. <laughs> and you defend yourself against the banditos. <laughs> and people are killed on both sides. <laughs> Whose fault is that? Is it the bandits, the people who live in the house? You might as well blame Abraham Lincoln for all the deaths in the American Civil War that freed the slaves. Actually, proportionately, per head of population, about the same number of people were killed. So no, uh, Marxism is not responsible for those deaths, imperialism is. But even some of the attacks on uh, the Stalinists are hypocritical. For example, they list uh, 1.5 million deaths in Afghanistan. In the, in the civil war uh, uh, that started in 1979. Now this is practically every death in that civil war. Despite the fact that the imperialists armed and funded the Mujahideen. With the most advanced weaponry, like rocket launchers. Uh, the Mujahid they don't like saying this, but the Mujahideen is now called the Taliban. And a so-called anti-Soviet freedom fighter was Osama bin Laden. So who was responsible for these deaths? Noam Chomsky actually did a comparative study using the method of the Black Book. 
per fare il nome, insomma, scrivo, fece uno studio comparativo usando i dati del libro nero. He analyzed uh, the difference between China and India from the Chinese Revolution. Now you can't accuse Noam Chomsky for being a Maoist sympathizer. <laughs> But uh, using the same method of the Black Book, He found a figure of 100 million excess deaths in India up to 1979. This is just two countries due to China's better health care, better distribution of resources. Now this is where we have to remind people, no, we do not support the political actions of the, of the Maoist bureaucracy. But India had 100 million more dead than China as of 1979. And there's many years after 1979. <laughs> The reality is that the black book of capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism is not a single book. It's a whole freaking library. 23 million dead in the First World War. I think 40 or 50 million dead in the Second World War. Decimation of indigenous policies and in, sorry, indigenous uh, populations in the Americas. The slave trade in Africa. Half a million dead in Iraq. After the intervention of Bush and Blair. Winston Churchill himself was complicit in the Bengal famine that killed millions. UNICEF, UNICEF estimates that millions of children die just for lack of basic sanitation and food every year. And a new report put out said they estimated 600 million dead uh, by a disease and yeah, malnutrition by nine. No, sorry, I'll start again. 600 million dead by disease and malnutrition by 2040. <laughs> It is high time that humanity turn the page on this system that is dripping with blood from every pore. We don't accept the 100 million dead by communism. But the deaths of capitalism number in the billions and billions. So, number nine. The fall of the Soviet Union proves, proves human nature is capitalist. <laughs> I'm running out of time and I've still got two lies to go. Maybe some of this stuff can come up in the discussion. Well, well, the reality is that uh, yeah, capitalism has only existed for a few hundred years. Whereas Homo sapiens has existed for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay. 
So somehow, uh, humanity was being unnatural for 99.9% .9 of its ex existence. No, it's blatantly ridiculous. And in fact, the people of the Soviet Union produced amazing things. They produced more doctors, scientists and engineers than any other country on the planet. And the reality is that it's ridiculous to talk about you know, the success of capitalism when we see crisis everywhere around us. But I think I'm going to uh, wrap things up at this point. And the final lie that people might want to uh, come in on the discussion was uh, nothing was achieved in the Russian Revolution. <coughs> but, we must, but we must remember, why are these lies coming? Precisely because around the world, people are looking to the lesson of the Russian Revolution. Hundred years after the revolution, we're seeing uh, outbursts of revolt everywhere. The ideas of the Russian Revolution are a threat to the status quo. And so it's necessary to answer these lies and give the workers and youth the answers they can to fight back. John Reed wrote his classic about the Russian Revolution, Ten Days That Shook the World. But now we see the top ten lies that try to maintain the status quo. But Lenin said the motor force of history is truth and not lies. And we have no interest in spreading falsehoods. Why would we want to lie to ourselves? As the revolutionary minority, we want a very clear perspective on the status quo. We demand a clear understanding of reality precisely so we can change it. And hopefully this discussion will help arm the comrades with the answers. To reach the workers and youth. So a hundred years after the revolution we can build a new October. And put all this lies and filth and death away. To build a new socialist society and a new future for humanity. Thank you. I hope comrades don't mind if I use the rest of the time to finish the leap. <laughs> now, there's too many lives, but I want to do two more at least. <laughs> so, uh, yes, the next line The fall of the Soviet Union proves human nature is capitalist. <laughs> When you look at the state of the world economy right now, this really is laughable. The fact that capitalism cannot develop the productive forces. The 
The fact there is mass unemployment. That they go from crisis to crisis to crisis. Yes, very, very natural indeed. Anyway, I'm not going to deal with this question from a philosophical or scientific viewpoint. But it's just not true that that's why the Soviet Union fell. Amazing things happened in the Soviet Union. Which had absolutely nothing to do with the Stalinist bureaucracy. All of this was despite the bureaucracy. But the people of the Soviet Union, organized through the planned economy, produced amazing things. Anybody who visited the, uh, the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe pri prior to the fall of Stalinism would have seen that people worked damn hard and damn smart. They produce more doctors, scientists, and engineers than any other country on the planet. If you look at productivity between 1913 and 1963, in Britain it rose 73%. In USA, it rose 332%. And in the Soviet Union, it was 1,310%. Due to the planned economy. Annual growth rates exceeded 10% in the same period when the uh, capitalist world went through the Great Depression. The Soviet Union had 205 doctors per 100,000 people. This is almost twice the number for Britain. In 1970, there were 257,000 engineering graduates. Compared with 50,000 for the USA. This, this contributed to many gr groundbreaking discoveries, Nobel Prizes. abject slander on the Soviet people to say that the regime fell due to their stupidity and laziness. So why did the Soviet Union fall despite the uh, brilliance of its people? The blame lies again with the Stalinist bureaucracy. Democ uh, so Trotsky explained that the, uh, a planned economy needs democracy like a human body needs oxygen. Uh, a planned economy works in a very different way from a capitalist economy. What is the check against inefficiency under capitalism? Well, 
If a capitalist company is inefficient, it will go bankrupt and be removed from the market. But a bureaucratically planned economy does not have this check. Inefficient productive processes can proceed indefinitely. And that's why a planned economy needs democracy. Workers' democracy. Economic democracy. Because 50 bureaucrats in Moscow cannot plan a complex economy. And the workers on the shop floor, if they see something stupid happen, happening, they'll stop it. And so that's why democracy is utterly essential for socialism. Now the, uh, the bureaucrats could plan basic industrialization. We need you know, this much steel, this many trains, etc. But when it came to, uh, a, when the economy got more complex in the 1960s and 70s, it could not be bureaucratically planned. The massive weight of stupidity, bureaucracy, inefficiency, nepotism. Turned from a relative fetter to an absolute break. The uh, Soviet economy stagnated from about 1970 onwards. And the Stalinist bureaucrats tried almost everything to get it going again. Except one thing, workers' democracy, that would actually have fixed the problem. Because, but they couldn't allow workers' democracy because that would have threatened their rule. So the uh, Soviet bureaucrats moved to make themselves capitalists. They bought up everything on the cheap and turned themselves into the present Russian oligarchy. But if this was, you know, a, a return to nature, surely it would have led to a boom in the productive forces. The return to capitalism in the Soviet Union was an abject disaster. There was a 60% reduction in GDP. Life expectancy went down by 15 years. It was, it was like the defeat in two wars. <laughs> and all the social ills of capitalism came back. <laughs> Alcoholism, prostitution, drug abuse, organized crime. <laughs> the position of women turned down very sharply. 
This is the legacy of capitalism. On the other side, a healthy, democratically planned economy could unleash the capabilities of the working class. The Stalinists thought that the workers were stu stupid drones. Stupid drones. But you know who else thinks the workers are stupid drones? The capitalists. Uh, any any uh, sort of business administration students will be taught that the workers are just stupid idiots. And all knowledge and inspiration comes from the so-called, you know, captains of industry. Well, these are the captains of industry that destroyed the economy in the world financial crash. Who presided over bankruptcy and layoffs and bailouts. And where in fact it is the workers on the shop floor who really know how things run. Who could really unleash productivity. Instead of being alienated from production under capitalism and Stalinism. For example, under, under capitalism, if a worker comes up with a good idea, his boss is just going to steal it. And then just uh, lay off as many workers as the increased production. So what is... So what is the incentive to innovate? Uh, whereas under a democratically planned society, innovations go for the betterment of all. The working class doesn't need more men with whips. We need to unleash the creativity of the people. <laughs> that currently goes untapped under capitalism. Okay, last line. Nothing was achieved during the Russian Revolution, or by the Russian Revolution. If nothing was achieved, why do they spend so, time, so much time and effort attacking it? Uh, Comrade spoke of the army of experts that are mobilized to, to attack the Russian Revolution. Experts, I should say, <laughs> who just peddle the same old lies in the same old books again and again and again. But there's a lot of money in this because it's an important part of maintaining the status quo. To say the Russian Revolution achieved nothing ignores reality. The planned economy took the Soviet Union 
from a position like Pakistan to being the second world superpower. In fact, uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the Second World War, the Soviet Union achieved, had no martial aid. And yet, the, uh, the growth in productivity in the Soviet Union was ten times that of the United States in the 20 years after the Second World War. The Soviet Union was the first country to put a man into space. Sputnik was the first satellite. It was amazing advancements. One of the main achievements of the Soviet Union was defeat of Nazi Germany. Hitler's Germany had access to the combined resources of the whole of continental Europe. And 90% of the fighting and dying of the Second World War was on the Eastern Front. This is something they never teach you in schools in the West. Britain and the United States were messing around in Africa and the Pacific trying to hold on to their colonial possessions. While the real fight went on in the East. The planned economy allowed the Soviet Union to outproduce Nazi Germany. <laughs> to this day, the Battle of Kursk is the largest tank battle in human history. German imperialism was defeated there and defeated at Stalingrad. And then the Red Army went, uh, engaged in the fastest advance in human history. The Soviet Union uh, liberated Eastern Europe. There was a Soviet soldier who raised the red flag over the Reichstag. And if it wasn't for the Western Front, the, the Red Army would have liberated the whole of Europe and they would have been met in Calais. That was all due to the success of the planned economy. And the gains of the revolution were not just economic but also social. Women in Britain didn't get the vote until 1928. But Soviet women achieved full legal equality in 1918. Canadian women weren't even legally defined as persons until 1929. They weren't defined as persons, that women were just objects. <laughs> no. 
So Soviet family law became gender neutral and homosexuality was legalized? An interesting anecdote, Trotsky actually took his wife's name and that was not seen as unusual. <laughs> Abortion was legalized decades before the West. Now much of this was undone under the Stalinist uh, counter-revolution. But for, despite this, by 1970, the Soviet Union achieved gender um, balance in higher education. <laughs> Significantly in, in advance of the capitalist West. The Soviet Union provided free, free health care and child care, something that still isn't the case in the United States. So, if you look at science and culture, there were amazing advances. An amazing explosion of experimental forms after the revolution. You had Eisenstein in cinema. Shostakovich in class classical music. Bolshoi Ballet. The Soviet Union became dominant in the Olympics. Uh, the foundations of modern evolutionary genetics were put in place by Theodore Dobzhansky. Now again, the Stalinists cut across this with socialist realism in the arts and Lysenkoism in biology. And the Stalinists could never allow full freedom in popular culture. For example, the CIA tried to use the Beatles and the Rolling Stones against the revolution. <laughs> But despite the Stalinist censorship, uh, classical arts in the Soviet Union remained second to none. So despite the bureaucratic blockade, amazing things were produced by the planned economy and the people. Just imagine what today's workers and youth could provide in a healthy workers' economy. Because what is holding everybody down is production for profit. And the capitalist mode of production. Society is lurching from one impasse to another. We need, to, we need to blow aside these fetters and unleash the potential of humanity. And to conclude, we've seen the lies against the Russian Revolution. But the lies aren't going to stop there. There's going to be new lies. 
bigger lies. More scandalous lies. You even saw that against us, uh, our comrades in Britain in the militant tendency. Neil Kinnock, the leader of the Labour Party in the 1980s, attacked us. <coughs> Accused Liverpool Labour of uh, sending out redundancy notices and taxes. It was a stupid and pathetic lie. But when blown up by the mass media, it became difficult to answer. For those who haven't, don't know about this lie, it, it was merely a tactic in the, uh, in the struggle with the Thatcher government. that if the, uh, the Liverpool Council didn't send out the redundancy notices, then it would be seen in, uh, be put in a legal budget right at that point. <laughs> so, so it was just a delaying tactic to gain an extra month in the struggle. And in hindsight, the comrades probably shouldn't have done it and just entered into the blatant illegality at that point. But everybody in Liverpool understood this. But it was blown up by the media and the Labour bureaucracy. But as we, as we have seen with Corbyn and with Trump, the media is not all powerful. In fact, they are in a very difficult position with Corbyn because they've thrown everything at him and he's still going forward. And every time their lies are discredited, they themselves become discredited. It is a tool that becomes blunted with each use. And as the genuine Marxists of the IMT move forward, we will face more and more lies, comrades. And comrades should not be sad about this. Militant in its height, there was a front page denunciation of us at least once a week. I, I'm really, I'm personally really looking forward to some good denunciations. <laughs> As they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Yeah, when there's a good attack on us, I, I suggest that all the comrades go out on the streets and do a public paper sale. <laughs> you can bet you're getting some good conversations answering those lies. And the best workers and youth will see who are attacking us. The fact that the class enemy are attacking us shows that we are right and doing the right thing. But we must be prepared to vociferously counter these lies. And, and I have absolute confidence that we'll be able to do that. 
Uh, one comrade asked for literature recommendations. Well, this article is going to come out in the next month or so. And, and, and literally, every lie is it's, it's a book in itself. <laughs> so there will be lots of links in that, uh, that article to other resources. History of the Russian Revolution is the great place to start. But I, I think I'll end with the words of Che Guevara. <laughs> is that, you can't blame me that reality is Marxist. <laughs> And with that idea, comrades, let's go out there and win the fight of ideas. Okay.